This is part two of 4.14 Vanderwall Forces. Again, apparently I need new headphones, so until that actually happens, you might get some shortened videos, so we'll just continue. Because the fluorine hydrogen bond has negative and positive poles, we call it a polar covalent bond. We also refer to polar molecules as dipoles. So di meaning two, poles meaning two ends. An object with two sides that have opposite characteristics or a positive and negative end. Because they have different charges at each end, we call them a dipole. Note that there must be differences in the electronegativity of the atoms within a covalent molecule for it to be polar. In other words, you can't have two atoms of the same element. You can't have two fluorines. You can have a fluorine, fluorine and an oxygen, a fluorine and a hydrogen, but again, it's the electronegativities. Polar molecules interact with each other like bar magnets do. Polar molecules are called dipoles because they have a partially positive end and a partially negative end. We have to say partially because when we did table salt, the sodium was positive, the chlorine was negative. Here, they're sharing electrons, they're just unequally sharing it. And so that's why you have a partially negative. A measure of the strength of the dipole is called the dipole moment and is related to the amount of charge at each end and the distance between the ends. The stronger the polarity, the bigger the dipole moment, or in other words, the strength of the dipole. Like tiny bar magnets, dipoles will interact. The similarly charged ends will repel each other, while oppositely charged ends will attract each other. These weak electrostatic interactions between polar compounds are called dipole-dipole forces. These forces weakly bind the molecules together, so they don't bond, they bind. It's kind of like if you use a cheap glue stick versus using super glue, okay? These are like cheap glue stick where you have the positive and negative. Yes, it causes them to line up, but you can probably just rip it apart. A bond, a chemical bond, like an ionic bond or covalent bond would be like using super glue. You have to do a chemical reaction to get it to come apart. So the fact that they, there are these intermolecular forces, these dipole, dipole forces, that affects properties like melting and boiling points. Nonpolar molecules are attracted by dispersion forces. Okay, nonpolar means what? Do they have a positive and negative end? Nope, they're the same everywhere. So like two hydrogens together, or two oxygens together, or two fluorines together. Consider race cars moving around a track. As a race progresses, the cars may be equally distributed around the track, but there are instances in time when the cars are bunched together at some point on the track and other parts of the track are empty. Electrons move around molecules in an electron cloud much like race cars move around a track. In nonpolar molecules, for the most part, the electrons are equally distributed in the cloud. However, there are brief instances when they are not. At these times, when the electrons accumulate at one end of a molecule, that end becomes partially negative, while the other end becomes partially positive, which makes sense. I mean, if all the electrons are over here, this side's going to be a little bit more negative than this side for that split second. At that instant, the temporary dipole interacts with a neighboring molecule and induces a dipole in the neighbor, like a domino effect. So, okay, so if this end becomes negative, well, then the next molecule, this side's going to want to be positive and negative positive, negative. So it's going to domino effect cause everyone else to kind of line up and change. And the molecules become bound electrostatically through weak forces called dispersion or London forces. Dispersion forces, an electric force between molecules as a result of random fleeting, so like split second creations of dipoles that domino effects and creates more and more dipoles. So they line up. Or London, like London, England. The larger the molecular weight, the greater the dispersion force. So the bigger the molecule, the bigger this negative end is going to be, which is going to be the bigger the dispersion force. All right. So initially, everything is negative and positive everywhere. But now here, look, we have a charge over here. It's a random buildup and it's an imbalance. And so here you can see we have a more negative end or partially negative and a partially positive end here. Well, what do you think is gonna happen here? Well, it's gonna be attracted to what? Which side, the positive or negative? The negative. So it forced this one to have an uneven sharing, which is gonna pull them together because they're attracted. And this is called a dispersion force. Once 
Now remember we said this was like a split second. So then after that split second they line up, but then they just kind of like, oh, nope, just kidding. We're going to go back to zooming all over our racetrack and it goes back to how it started. So they're very split second. Dispersion, our London forces explain the room temperature state of halogen gases. The halogen gases are in the same group on the periodic table, yet at room temperature, chlorine, fluorine are, are gases, bromine is a liquid, and iodine is a solid. And of course, what's wrong about this? That C has to be capitalized. Why? Why are some gases liquid and solid? The different states of these halogens at room temperature can be explained by the principle of dispersion forces. The more electrons there are, the greater the dispersion forces between the molecules. In this case, chlorine and fluorine have fewer electrons overall than the other halogens. The dispersion forces are therefore less. The result is that the chlorine and fluorine are gases. Bromine has more electrons and thus is a liquid. Iodine has even more electrons, so the London or dispersion forces are greater, and the iodine molecules are pulled closer together. And so at room temperature, iodine is a solid. But you can see they are always what? Paired up. They're always diatomic. Hydrogen bonds form between hydrogen atoms and electronegative atoms on adjacent molecules. So water. Whenever you think of water, you should think of hydrogen bonding. Here is another kind of intermolecular force. In a molecule, when hydrogen is bound to a strongly electronegative atom, for example oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, there is a strong polar covalent bond. The hydrogen is partially positive, and the electronegative atom is always partially negative. The hydrogen of this molecule can also be attractive electrostatically to an unshared pair of strongly electronegative atom of the neighboring molecule. This electrostatic bond is called the hydrogen bond. So, okay, the fact that there are, there are extra electrons here around the oxygen and here, because remember, Oxygen has to have eight electrons, so in this empty space, there's actually two pairs of electrons. And I'm not sure what they're doing here, if they're saying what it's attracted to, because the oxygen is negative, the hydrogens are positive. And so this negative oxygen is attracted to the positive side, which is the hydrogen. This negative oxygen is attracted to the positive side. This positive hydrogen is attracted to the negative oxygen. Personally, I would have made these charges backwards, like the positive and negative, but there's a lot of mistakes on this slide, isn't there? Haha. <laughs> Good thing I didn't make it, so it's not my fault. <laughs> All right, but basically, they line up. They line up positive to negative. Water H2O is a polar molecule. Oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen atom, so the two HO bonds are polar. Water molecule has partially positive and partially negative ends. The hydrogen atoms thus will form hydrogen bonds with the unshared electron pairs of the oxygen atoms on the adjacent next to water molecules. Hydrogen ex bonding explains the expansion freezing in water. So usually when things get solid, they come closer together. But in water, instead, it's going to expand because of that positive and negative. And when they line up, there's actually empty space in between them. And that empty space makes it float. So that's why ice floats on the top. And it's also why water expands when it freezes. When water freezes, the positive ends of the water molecules are attracted to the negative ends of the other water molecules. That's why it's called an intermolecular force, creating an open crystal structure. In this case, a six-sided crystal. The ice crystal has a large open space and occupies a larger volume than six compacted molecules alone. So see, these six together take up this much space. Six other ones only take up like this much space. So water takes up more space when it freezes, and ice has a lower density than liquid water, and therefore it causes ice to float. Hydrogen bonds create surface tension. Water molecules at the surface of the liquid will be attracted to each other by hydrogen bonding. This attraction makes them stick together and gives water a high surface tension. Because of this high surface tension, water sticks to itself along its surface. This property allows small insects to walk on the surface of water and explains why small drops of water form a sphere, because they're attracted to each other. The closest they can get together is through a circular shape. Three-dimensionally, that's the way to get the smallest or the closest. And remember, this is what I talked about too. If you slap the water with your hand, it hurts. Or if you belly flop, it hurts because 
the water wants to stick together because of hydrogen bonding creating surface tension. Hydrogen bonding is important in biology. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, has nitrogen bases that form the rungs of the double helix structure. These nitrogen bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, are held together by hydrogen bonds. The bonds can be easily broken and reformed when DNA makes copies of itself. So again, this dotted line saying, okay, we'll line up next to each other because these electrons, pairs around the outside of the oxygen, are attracted to the positive hydrogen. Again, it's only partially positive because it still has enough electrons around it, but nitrogen's not letting them have it 50% of the time. Similarly, the amino acids that make up proteins contain strongly electronegative atoms, nitrogen and oxygen. Amino acids bind together covalently like links in a chain. However, hydrogen bonds form between neighboring amino acids and cause the chain to coil like a spring or fold like an accordion. Hydrogen bonding affects the shape of proteins, which is important to their many, many functions. So this is huge. Hydrogen bonding changing shapes of proteins. Proteins have to be the correct shape in order to do their function. Polar molecules can bind to ions. All right, so we talked about this a little bit already, right? You've seen this picture before. The intermolecular forces discussed this far are dipole-dipole forces, dispersion forces. So dispersion was between what? the nonpolar, like the instantaneous, the domino effect, and hydrogen bonds, are collectively called van der Waal forces after Nobel Prize winning physicist Johannes Diedrich van der Waals. But there is one other type of intermolecular force to introduce here. Because polar molecules have a positive and negative end, they can interact with other charged particles like ions. The positive ends of the dipole can be attracted to anions, while the negative ends can be attracted to cations. These intermolecular forces are called ion-dipole forces. Why? Because we have our ion, right, our sodium chloride, and it's attracted to a dipole. Ion-dipole forces get stronger with the charge of either the ion or the dipole. They are important for the solubility, so the fact that ions can dissolve, in polar substances such as water, and the reason salts like sodium chloride dissolve in water so easily and conduct electricity when they are dissolved in water. Intermolecular forces are weak, okay? So again, it's like using the cheap glue stick versus super glue. Super glue would be your ionic bonds, your covalent bonds, okay? I don't like that they put ionic bonding in here. Um, intermolecular forces between an ion, like sodium chloride, and a dipole, like water, or your van der Waal forces, your dispersion, hydrogen bonding, and dipole-dipole. When atoms in a covalently bonded molecule don't share electrons equally, they create a polar molecule, so polar, it has poles, with a partially positive end and a partially negative end. Dipoles interact with each other and with ions, polar molecules with hydrogen bound to strong electronegative atoms, generally nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, form relatively strong hydrogen bonds. All molecules have weak dispersion forces from the movements of electrons in the cloud, just like a racetrack, right? Just like a traffic jam. Sometimes like all the cars are in one spot. Same idea. Sometimes all the electrons are in one spot. Dispersion forces are proportional to the molecular weight. So the bigger the molecule, the stronger the dispersion forces because there's more electrons. There's simply more of them. You're going to have a bigger traffic jam in Minneapolis than you are in... Rosno. I hope that's how you say it. I'm obviously not from Minnesota. <laughs> All right. Intermolecular forces, which are very weak compared to ionic and covalent bonds, affect properties such as boiling and melting point. So the fact that there's hydrogen bonding between water helps keep the water tighter together, the molecules, which means it takes more energy to break them apart, which means more energy to boil, more energy to melt than if there weren't any of those hydrogen bonds.